Now, Israel's war cabinet is weighing up how to respond to an Iranian drone and missile attack, which thankfully saw 99% of missiles shot down. That was with the help of the US, UK, France and Jordan. Well, the US Secretary General has urged nations not to escalate tensions with reprisals against Iran, saying it's time to step back from the brink. US President Joe Biden has said, well, take the win to Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, joining me right now to discuss what Israel does next is Fleur Hassan Nahum. She's the Israeli Foreign Ministry Special Envoy and also outgoing Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. A good morning to you, Fleur. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining. I know you're in New York right now, so it's the middle of the night for you, so hugely appreciate uh, you joining us. Um, uh, Fleur, um, United Nations Secretary General calling for, you know, you know, basically, you know, show restraint. Joe Biden saying show restraint. Many world leaders, we have David Cameron, the, the uh, Foreign Secretary of the UK, saying, you know, urging uh, restraint. Um, should Israel show restraint at this time? Well, it's interesting how nobody asked Iran to show restraint last week when they made it very, very clear that they were about to attack Israel. Uh, and I don't think anybody expected the scale of the attack, over 300 missiles that came in all forms, from suicide drones to ballistic missiles. And the thing is that if we wouldn't have had such a successful defense, uh, defense operation, what would people be saying now? Would they be feeling much better if thousands of innocent people would have died and that's okay then to retaliate? Look, I don't know what in the end Israel will do because there is fierce debate at the moment in Israel of what we should do. Should we take the win, as Biden says? But what people don't seem to understand is that Iran is an existential threat to Israel. It's marching towards a nuclear bomb. They've already said they want to destroy Israel. They made it very clear two nights ago that they are on a mission to destroy Israel. They fund Hamas, they fund Hezbollah, they fund the Houthis that are attacking also British assets in the Gulf. They fund uh, groups in Iraq. And so these are the really, really bad guys at the moment. These are the Hitler. This is the 1930s Germany of today is Iran. And where are the Churchills? That's my question. Yes, we've, we've, been, we've certainly been looking for some Churchills in, in recent years and not really seen very much sign of them. It is fascinating, isn't it, the, uh, the expectations of Israel uh, as opposed to the expectations we have our, of our own governments. When I think back to 9-11 and that bomb attack that killed 3,000, well, just an airplane attack, sorry, in New York uh, and the Pentagon. Um, and, of course, you know, the entire world, I mean, Western world, the United Nations united in basically blowing up Afghanistan in retaliation. There weren't calls for, you know... For, for restraint, restraint. there. Restraint. Uh, and, that's, and that's the thing. And also this claim, of course, that, uh, well, this was in retaliation of your attack on the Revolutionary you know, National Guard in, uh, in, in, in Damascus. But, of course, that was not a civilian target in the same way these mass civilian targets. So um, the argument for taking the win, as Joe Biden and, and others have suggested, is that Israel has been seeing support waning among Western allies, I think outrageously, frankly, uh, in recent uh, months, uh, as we've seen uh, more and more civilians in Gaza die and, and there are big concerns about humanitarian aid and food and basics getting in to those people. We've seen the Western allies uniting behind Israel on this circumstance with military might and expertise and helping to hopefully save is Israeli lives. Is there a win there? Is there something to accept? And actually keeping that keeping that alliance strong, keeping that Western allies on the side with Israel and that show of strength to Iran, is that something that is a win that Israel should take? Uh, well, I think there is a diplomatic win here, of course, and that is that well, without the Americans, without the British, without the help of the French, and ironically, the Jordanians. So think about this. Think about the new Middle East, where the moderate Sunni countries are actually allying themselves with Israel against Iran, because the Jordanians also know that Iran is a threat to them. The Saudis know the same thing. The Emiratis know the same thing. And so, yes, there is something here about a diplomatic win with this alliance. But, you know, I, I hate to think that the world is only behind Israel when we're being attacked, when somehow we're the victims. But at the same time, we don't have that right to defend ourselves and stop further attacks. So that's kind of what bothers me.
Yeah, I mean, in terms of what can happen next, though, we know there's a war cabinet's had a three-hour meeting yesterday, haven't decided on what they're going to do, but there will be some sort of retaliation, is the expectation, as we'd expected from Iran. What, what level of retaliation do you think would be enough that Israel has said, we've had our revenge, but wouldn't escalate tensions even more? Because, again, just as Israel would have expected some sort of retaliation from Iran for the attack in Damascus, Iran cannot possibly think there wouldn't be some sort of retaliation for the Israelis for what happened at the weekend. So what could be the level of retaliation? And it's absurd we're talking about this, like it's a game of risk, when in fact it involves, you know, know. risk of life uh, to, to thousands of people. But what sort of level of attack, an attack on a couple of military targets, would that suffice to sort of save Israel's face but also not so much that the Iranians don't go in for another tit-for-tat attack. What, are, we, are we talking about a sort of diplomatic tightrope here? Well, you know, I want to say something. Even after October 7th, Israel did not act impulsively. It took us two weeks, two weeks, to go into Gaza to decide what we were going to do and how we were going to take out all those terrorists, all those battalions of terrorists. Israel is not impulsive when it comes to retaliation or when it comes to defending its people. And again, you shouldn't expect an impulsive attack here because that would have happened today already or yesterday already if it would have been impulsive. And I really don't know, I'm not a military expert, I can't tell you what suffices. But for us, it's not about revenge, it's not about retaliation, it's about defending ourselves from an existential threat, which is Iran. People seem to take this very lightly. But you have a massive country that is marching towards a nuclear weapon, that is funding all the terrorism that is attacking Israel, and by the way, the West, and by the way, Europe. They're the state exporters of terrorism. They're marching towards a nuclear bomb, and they've said they want to destroy Israel. And so this is not revenge. This is defense at its best. And everything Israel ever does is in defense. The reason we're in Gaza is defensive. You know, you had a lovely lady, Julia, speaking earlier, which I heard a little bit of, and she said, well, the bombing of Gaza. You know, I wish we could be bombing Gaza. We're not. We're losing young men. We're losing young women, soldiers out there, because we don't bomb indiscriminately, because we go house to house to weed out the terrorists that have been embedded in civilian populations. It would be very easy for Israel to bomb. But we don't. We always take the legal and we always take the high road. And unfortunately, nobody seems to understand. This. Well, I, I, exactly. I mean, you're certainly looking at an awful lot of uh, you know, Western governments, uh, Western opposition leaders uh, and indeed media being very critical of Israel. I just want to bring us back to, to Gaza just right now. There, there is still this massive concern about... Uh, the civilian population. Hamas still sitting there in, in Gaza, no doubt at all in Rafah. There hasn't been that Rafah offensive. We don't know whether it will happen or not. Um, lots of uh, Israeli troops pulled out of Gaza, but we have not still seen the scale of aid going in. I mean, 300 trucks, we're told, uh, you know, going in uh, yesterday. Well, you know, 300 trucks for, you know, 2.3 million people isn't enough. When is enough aid going to be going in to Gaza, to the civilian population that you, the Israelis, claim, the Israeli government claim they care so much about, but that we know are suffering? Regardless of the rights and wrongs of the Israeli actions, we know civilian civilians are dying and civilian civilians, so, 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 and, and Palestinian civilians are, are suffering malnutrition and lack of medicine. You know, Julia, I, I want to contest that. First of all, there's hundreds and hundreds of trucks of aid going in. The problem is not in the quantity of aid going in. More aid is going into Gaza than any conflict. I mean, you want to talk about famine. There's a famine in Sudan killing millions of people, but nobody's talking about them. Every, everything in Gaza where they're on the brink of famine. Well, they've been on the brink of famine for a month. Do you remember when they were on the brink of running out of fuel in November? And when they were on the brink of running out of water, they're always on the brink. And somehow, everything's still there and everything's still functioning. And you see food being sold in the open market. And so the problem is not the aid going in or lack of aid going in. There's tons and tons and tons of aid going in. The problem is the distribution of that aid, which is down to God, uh, you know, God, which is down to terrorists and human rights organizations who have terrorists embedded within their staff. That's the problem. It's okay. not the aid Israel's letting or not letting in. And let me just say some, one more thing. Why isn't anybody talking to Egypt? 
Why are they absolutely wash their hands? They have a border with Gaza. No aid is going in through Egypt. Not only that, they've, they've built three more walls between Gaza and Egypt. And there is zero expectation that a country which is supposedly neutral should be helping their brethren over there. And all of the pressure is on Israel, who was the party that was attacked. It seems okay. a little unfair. Fleur Hassan Nahum, Israeli Foreign Ministry Special Envoy, also outgoing Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. Thank you for joining us.